So Eli has certainly created um, with at least a piece of this problem in mind. And that is, um, and this is what I've written about as well now in that piece that I mentioned, but also in another one. Um, so if we think about the, the underlying theory of how we learn from peers, um, from Vygotsky, the, the, the notion of peer scaffolding, um, it really hinges on one very important thing. And I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again in the theory language. And that is um, peer scaffolding requires that you first be able to identify with a more capable peer. Right? So you have to look around and, and see someone who is a co-learner, someone who's trying to learn the same thing you are, and who is slightly more proficient than you are at that moment. They don't have to be better than you forever. So I have this picture in the book that I like to show um, of a dance recital, and, and, and there are two little girls, or in one case there are four, four little girls, and they're all doing a, the same dance moves, right? Except one of them is not. One of them is sneaking a look over at her fellow performer slash learner to try to, because she's off, right? She's, she's not on the right foot. But that other one is, she's in full performance mode. You can see she's facing the audience and she's <laughs> got it, right? So for that moment, I mean, that's pure scaffolding right there. Yep. And, and then if you, if you would fast forward two more measures the situation could be reversed. She could be on the right foot and her other co-learner needs a, needs a peak, right? And if you go to a kid's dance recital, you see that all the time. So what, what Vygotsky is trying to tell us in, in this concept um, of peer scaffolding and, and the broader um, phenomenon that he calls the zone of proximal development is that when those learners are working together on the stage – they're all more capable of more than they would be working alone, soloing on that stage. Because the mere environment of having co-learners in close proximity identifying each other means that there are re learning resources provided in those interactions. Mm -hmm. That's why I like to emphasize in that dance recital how, you know, just a few measures um, – uh, determine the role of the more capable peer, it isn't that these are strict hierarchies where we have this person is always going to be ahead of this person. It, it's, a, it's an ongoing scene of action where I'm more proficient a little bit at this moment and then maybe I need a little help in this moment. And so that's why it, you have to constantly be monitoring and status checking um, as a to make that peer scaffolding environment work. And, and you can see this. I mean, the people who are most expert at this are early childhood um, teachers. They set their learning environments up this way. They're activity centers. And they set them up with clear lines of sight on purpose so that, so that the kids can use one another as the primary resource for solving problems and, and resolving little ambiguities and whatever. Um, they don't want 30 kids, you know, asking that the teacher what to do next. They really want to see this person learn from that person learn from that person. Mm -hmm. That's cool. we don't. For some reason, we we don't do that once learners become more adult. Um, I don't know why. What what makes us think that that mode of learning is invalid? But 